Hello, we're here in Oxford at the Skoll World Forum uh, in the UK, and with me is Ruka Sombolingi, Secretary General of the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of the Archipelago, otherwise known as AMAN, uh, an advocacy group for Indigenous communities in Indonesia. Ruka, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. You yourself are from the Torridon community in the highlands of Sulawesi. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the communities that uh, you represent at Aman and, and uh, the kind of challenges they face? Aman, we represent 20 million indigenous peoples across Indonesia. Our members are indigenous peoples communities and today we have uh, around 3,000 communities as our members. The challenges are uh, varies from uh, one community to the other. But in, in uh, the general challenges that we face today uh, with regards to the lack of recognitions and legal protections uh, from our government then uh, resulted in uh, land grabbings. The uh, private, private corporates can easily grab our land uh, and also government mm -hmm. will facilitate uh, giving them the permits. So we lost our land to uh, plantations, uh, oil palm, industrial uh, plantations like paper, pulp and paper, mining, logging, and uh, coal. So uh, including also to fisheries um, uh, companies. So it's across the country, there's massive um, loss of indigenous first land. In the last 10 years, we have lost uh, around 8.4 million hectares of our uh, ancestral land. And the loss of land is not just the loss of land, but when they're taking away our land, uh, that's where all this intimidation and criminalization is also happening. It's the way to expedite uh, taking uh, the land away from us. So. Aside of the loss of our land in the last 10 years, we also suffer more than 1,000 uh, cases of criminalization. Mm -hmm. So we have to uh, work a lot on legal cases. Uh, uh, in Amman, we do have a, our uh, lawyers associations as the wing organizations of Amman, and uh, the members is uh, more than 180 lawyers, and they work night and day to uh, protect um, indigenous peoples from being uh, arrested, from being sent to jails. Mm -hmm. uh, some some um, succeeded, uh, but uh, many more failed. Now we have uh, many indigenous leaders are in jail. Mm -hmm. um, with all these problems around climate change, we are also facing challenges because uh, our community, indigenous peoples, are also facing um, the impact of climate change. A prolonged drought, um, decrease um, of harvest, and um, and what what do you want to see done to in increase um, your resilience to climate change? We we. We learn a lot that, um, and this is also have been proven uh, by the scientific um, research that uh, majority of the best ecosystem, including forests that we have today, uh, is actually because of indigenous peoples are the one who's taking care of them, and we we are doing that. We are protecting our land and our forest and our ecosystems it's not really just for us but for everybody so what we what we've been doing is we try to restore the land that have been destroyed by uh, mining by uh, logging by all the private sectors but at the same time uh, our government prevent us to do so because they claim uh, that land as the state land We've been also the we we are lucky that we have uh, um, indigenous women who are very um, strong and uh, also our indigenous uh, youth, the young generations. We they've been uh, there, there there has been a 
big movement. We call it a homecoming movement of the young people coming back from the cities to mm -hmm. go back to our, our community and uh, live from our community, take care of our community. And we, of course, we have to help them because being in indigenous community, when you, when you uh, go home from city, uh, oftentimes people will see you as failure. So we also have to uh, provide that connections and bridge between the um, homecoming uh, people, people who came home with the community so they can be accepted. And in that way, we, we get them together to work and they developed uh, indigenous schools with women, with elders, and from there they can expand to build the community resiliency in terms of a food a food a first we have to have enough food so food that we produce from our land so we they build like granary um communities granary collective granaries and where where we have to make sure that we will have we learn from pandemic that uh, initially, we thought it was the pandemic will all, only last for the uh, for six months. So we say we have to have uh, enough food for six months. Uh, we were wrong. Uh, it's it's uh, it, it took years already. And uh, but uh, we learned from that, and now we have uh, more and more of the food resiliency happening at uh, community level across Indonesia, and even during the crisis. Indigenous peoples, the villagers, are the one who who bring the food to other community who don't have enough food, and uh, also to take care of our elderly, to take care of our women, mm -hmm. to take care of other disadvantaged, and to bring food to the cities. Um, but food is not enough because we also need cash. So we couple this, we match the food sovereignty resiliency with economic resiliency. So first we have enough food and we keep enough for at least six months because six months or until one year is the, the time when you will have another harvest. And then once you have that enough, we then uh, can sell something. So that's where the cash crops coming in, mm -hmm. the economic resiliency. Uh, but these two, they have to come together. Otherwise, the economic resiliency, the cash crop will defeat, will, will defeat the food. And that is dangerous for the resiliency of the community. The um, young people and the whole community, they started to do, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the restorations of the landscape, our landscape. And that's how we will continue to contribute not just to us, but for the rest of humanity. And last year at the Skull World Forum, a man um, received an award for social innovation. What are the sort of, um, I know one of the things that you've been doing um, in terms of innovation is um, mapping the um, indigenous territories in Indonesia. What do you, what are you doing with that information or what do you want to see, um, how do you want to see that information being used? Yeah, uh, last year, uh, last year we uh, reported that we have about 25 million hectares. And this year, uh, we just uh, update the map and we have 28, 000, uh, 28 million hectares uh, land that we map. But map is not just map. Map is the foundations or the baseline of, uh, for us to continue to work. Based on the map, then we discuss, the community will discuss the zonation of the land, the land allocations, which part should be for the protected areas, which part for uh, the farming areas, which part for the rituals, the sacred areas that is um, that cannot be touched, and the uh, residential areas, you know, and plots that are a, you know, for a collective farm and everything. So that's that's uh that's what a map can serve and for indigenous peoples because of the because of the the 
the transformation in the way of life some of us we we have already uh, very much don't remember our history so based on the map we go back and learn again and that's the role of the indigenous schools also indigenous schools really um, uh, the origin of indigenous schools is the awareness that we don't want to lose everything including our knowledge mm. so this has been expanded now we have more than 100 indigenous schools across indonesia and map is also very important to use as the tools to prove that we exist especially to our government and uh, we continue to to uh, send our map to government and say this land you have to return to us because the in 2014 there is the decision by uh, constitutional court uh, national constitutional court saying that indigenous peoples we have the land we have the rights of our land and territories including our forest so that's the obligation now for the government to protect our rights and to return our land that have been so far claim as state forest. Mm. So today we have uh, more than 200,000 um, land uh, that is that has been returned by uh, our uh, government to us. And those are very small numbers compared to, um, to permits that they gave to the companies, the permit to they give to the uh, social forestry, for example, but this small number will never decrease, but will only be increased. We started with 5,000 hectares and now we are at uh, 200,000 hectares. Mm. The number will increase until one day we get back all of our land. Yeah, guess cross. Um, and uh, on, the, on the world stage, we're um, seeing you know, countries have pledged to end deforestation by 2030, um, but recent reports suggest that, that actually in some countries tree cover loss is, is still increasing. What do you see uh, happening in Indonesia? Do you, um, are there signs of positive action on this front? The well, um, unfortunately, while we are talking about our responsibility to at least uh, maintain the intact forest as it is, and even um, increase the the forest cover, right? The situations in Indonesia, I think, going on the opposite way because of there is no restrictions on uh, deforestations, so government continue to to give out a permit to corporates and uh, for example they <laughs> they use forest uh, for a what they call a food estate you know so in order to plant um, cassava or corn they cut down the forest uh, which in some of the media, big media report things saying that uh, those are actually failed. And, and uh, but they are, have already cut down the forest. Uh, it's the same. It's the same thing with the new. Um, now we're talking about all this mantra at uh, global level. We talk about uh, energy transition, just transition, green transition, mm -hmm. um, net zero. Uh, we do agree with that. But the problem is those what we call remaining uh, ecosystem today are also the home of what of critical minerals. And uh, we cannot we cannot continue to uh, sacrifice our environment for the sake of our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think what we need to do today is really um, change the way we consume. Uh, it's the lifestyle of us who who drove us to this problem. Yeah. So those are the fundamental things we need to change. Yeah. And uh, let's talk a bit about carbon markets because I know indigenous uh, groups have been very 
quite critical uh, about these. What's what are your thoughts on these mechanisms that allow countries and enable countries and companies to offset their carbon emissions? Yeah, we. Uh, I think the main problem uh, that uh, have been uh, the concern of indigenous peoples across the globe is uh, we are not fixing the problem by going back to the you know that system same system again um, market based uh, we know the market failed us the climate change is uh, the result of the market failure and we try to find solution for climate change we are going back again to the same system uh, things first uh, by common sense that's impossible and the second one is now we create divisions among um, indigenous peoples, about, among um, environmental defenders, uh, the protector of the environment, of the forest, because when we get the payment from the company who, um, who pay for the carbon credit, we might get a payment from the company, but at the same time they continue to kill our sister uh, and brother somewhere else. I think that's uh, morally unacceptable. And the second one is it's, it's dangerous in the country where indigenous people's rights uh, are not recognized. Like in Indonesia, the, the, now the government actively uh, give out concession for carbon projects to companies. So they, we don't, we, even the land that have been destroyed by logging, by mining, um, for indigenous peoples, even if we want to restore them, rehabilitate them, we cannot because the government will give them to the private company. Mm. And so today, and because of all of this payment for the forest, for the carbon, today the government will get incentives from, being, from denying our rights. And that's because of the 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 money and i think also there's so so much of the misleading information and misconception going around uh, indigenous people's uh, territory we 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 have heard the report from our community saying that uh some of the carbon um, promoters come to their community and say that if you accept the carbon uh, market, if you want to join, then you will get the money kind of it's like a money like leaves falling down the trees. Like so much money. And we've, that's historical trauma because that's the same way corporates trick us down in the past mm. they promise you uh, jobs they promise you prosperity they promise you schools they promise you a free health uh, system they promise you wealth and nothing of those promises is materialized and the same thing happening again and the lastly is People still don't know what will happen if you join the carbon, if your forest become for carbon credit. To what extent you can um, you can still connect and manage your forest, harvest from food from the forest. Do we still be able to do that if they are already part of the carbon uh, credit, carbon market, and putting the price? On, on our forest, it's, it sounds so non-indigenous. It's, it's, for me, myself, it feels weird that I will put the a price of one tree in my, my, the back of my house, forest, like five dollars for one year. It's like, it's like renting a room. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't rent out our room, mm -hmm. our house. You know, we welcome people. What we need is protection to protect us so this tree will not be cut down by company. 
to protect us so we will continue to nurture protect us so we we can multiply the forest cover that we have today the one that has been destroyed by the government we need the protection we need the support so we can heal them so that's other thing that we need to we we need to do and it's not about putting price on every single tree in our backyard mm. how can the scientific community and the research community help support indigenous people <sighs> to to um sites to uh, a major um major uh, elements that we need to uh, we need to work with uh, science uh, scientists first is to really prove that our economic system uh, that's our livelihood traditional livelihood it's actually worth more than macroeconomy uh, that the money that we contribute to our development at local level at community level at district level and at national level is actually much higher than what the corporates contributes right because they only pay tax they only pay a little bit of uh, what's so called dividend something something uh, but indigenous peoples we actually contribute so much more we already have that study uh, five years ago but it's still, still at a very small scale so we need to expand it we need to empower the local universities to also join this collaboration so we make it like universal movement you know of scientists you know finding out who are the real who is what is the real economy the real economy that will sustain us and the second one as we talk about the loss and the damage we have suffered from the climate change this also needs to be proved and i think the same the same simple methodology that we can use to prove our economic uh, strength can also be used to provide that okay if we if we if the if the temperature goes down like one degree how much more we will suffer because we already suffer today as i mentioned on earlier prolonged drought um in my community uh, in Taraja, we are very well known of a uh, coffee we produce one of the best coffee of the, in the world uh, i must say that because i'm from there and um the harvest hasn't been good we haven't uh, we haven't had the best coffee that we have is not yet ready for harvest uh we will i we communicate with community and they say we probably will have harvest only by july or by 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 june they will already start the harvest but the peak will be the big harvest will be only in july and that's because of the extreme weather uh, too much too much they call it too much water meaning too much rain and uh not enough sun so the the um coffee doesn't flower or if they flower they cannot um bear fruit because they will become rotten because of its uh, the the too much water we're at the school world forum what's the one message that you want to make heard here as for a for everyone we need to work together this is our collective um collective responsibility and for indigenous peoples um contributions first we need to really work towards the protections of the rights of indigenous peoples and then uh most importantly 
driving and sending and uh, providing a direct support for indigenous peoples to continue the work that we are doing and multiply uh, the contributions that we already have today. Rika, thank you so much for your time. It's been a thank delight you. to talk to you. Thank you.